I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that just wants to worship Jesus. You can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place because the church is not this building. The church is the body of Christ. And it's evident that you want to worship God not just in this building, but every single day of your life. And when you come in this place and we've worshiped him all week long individually, and you come in and you hear people lead us in worship about our beautiful lion and lamb and our savior Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross at Calvary, it just overwhelms me as your pastor to be your pastor, that you would allow me, the sinner that I am, to proclaim the truths of God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit and I've been a part of a lot of churches, but I've never been a part of a church like this one. So thank you for being disciples of Jesus Christ who truly want to die to yourself, not worry about what you want, but focus on one thing, and that's giving glory to your Savior, Jesus Christ. We're in this series now that we started last Sunday entitled, I Believe, because in Latin, credo, is I believe, and it's the first word in Latin of the Apostles' Creed, I believe. And we looked at last week in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so John 8, you'll see on your handout and in the, on the screen, and then we'll get into what it means to believe in the second part of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. But John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was not born in Bethlehem as God. He was already here. He's pre-existence. He put on the form of flesh in Bethlehem and came to this earth, but he was already here. Before Abraham was, Jesus says, I am. He's equating himself as a part of the Trinity with God. The Apostles' Creed goes this way. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. We'll focus on that this morning. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Here's the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one local church, one nationwide, worldwide believers in Jesus Christ, one holy church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, hallelujah, and the life everlasting, amen. And we're not here to learn about a creed. We're here to learn about what God says he is in his holy word. But the Apostles' Creed gives us scripture references from the scriptures give us the Apostles' Creed statements. So we're gonna look at very important belief, doctrines that we should understand as followers of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things we can argue about, whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, or whether you even care about the trib at all. We can argue about a lot of different things but these are things that we can't waver over. Who God is, almighty maker of heaven and earth, we talked about last week. Who Jesus is as he's revealed himself to us in his word. He's Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Next week we'll talk about what it means that he was born by the Holy Spirit and why it's important that we believe in the virgin birth. But these are essential statements that Legend says the disciples sat down before they were persecuted and spread and came up with each one of these statements so that they could not teach contrary to what Jesus had taught them. But that's a legend. We have no proof of that. We do know some 40 to 60 years after that that the Apostles' Creed was used in the early church because many Christians could not read. And so when they became followers of Jesus Christ, they wanted instilled in them the important doctrines of our faith, so they taught them the Apostles' Creed. Many times before they were baptized, they would have to recite the Apostles' Creed or use it to answer questions so that they would know the basic doctrines of our faith, the basics of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're teaching it 
on Sunday morning because it's biblical and because I believe we live in a world today that has gotten away from the basic doctrines of our faith and we need to return to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to know who God is. We need to know who his son Jesus is and we need to know who the Holy Spirit is. For some reason in Southern Baptist churches, we've gotten away from the power of the Holy Spirit because it sounds Pentecostal. Well, I'm Baptist, so it's okay. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And so this morning, we're gonna focus on who Jesus is. I can't think of a more important question for everyone in this world to answer. We'll all have to answer this question one day. Who is Jesus? Where did he come from? Why did he come? What difference does he make in my life and in yours? Everybody has to deal with that question. Who is Jesus Christ? You know, and if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Matthew 16 momentarily. You can turn there. You can get your hand out, out from your connection, your order of service this morning to follow along with us. Very simple message, but I think something that we need to make sure we understand the basic truths about who Jesus is. But in Matthew 16, you would think if anybody understood who Jesus was, it was his disciples who would spend time with him physically. And so in Matthew 16, verse 13, Matthew 16, verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They're gonna give him four answers. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, and the fourth answer are one of the prophets. He said to them, Jesus did, in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Now Simon Peter is like myself, he sticks his foot in his mouth a lot. But he gets it right here. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What does it mean that he's the Christ and what does it mean that he's the son, the only son of the Lord God? We're gonna talk about that this morning. I love the Apostles' Creed because it's biblical. I also love the Apostles' Creed because it comes in a story format. It's not like you can take some of these statements in the Apostles' Creed and shuffle them in the different orders. It comes in order. God made this universe. He's the maker of the heavens and the earth. God came and then he sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of the virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's in order. Then he came and he died on the cross. He was buried. He rose on the third day to give us victory over death and victory over the grave, to give us true life. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sent. We're gonna talk about that last in the Apostles' Creed. It's in the order that it happened in the scriptures. I also like the Apostles' Creed because it's biblical and it's Trinitarian. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in three, God, three in one God, one God in three forms. And people say the word Trinity is not in the Bible and they're absolutely correct. But there's evidence in the scriptures because Jesus says when you've seen the Father, you have seen me and I and the father are one and Jesus says unless I leave this place I, I can't send another one like myself to indwell you talking about the Holy Spirit so we know there's proof in the scriptures that God exists in three forms father son Holy Spirit but it's amazing in the Apostles Creed and the way I phrased it for you there's 105 words 66 deal with Jesus you know, we have a saying at First Baptist Church, Slidell, Christ-centered, because it's really all about Jesus. It's all about him. If we understand anything about the gospel, we've got to understand who Jesus is. This world will give you all the viewpoints they have about who Jesus is. Some will say he's a good man. Some will say he was just a good teacher. Some will say he's just a prophet. We believe he is the Christ. We believe he is the savior of the world. We believe he's God himself. We believe he's Lord Almighty. And we believe he's coming back again to call us home to glory in heaven. We believe those things about Jesus. That's why the credo means I believe. Amen. What do you believe about Jesus? We live in a world that says that's just being too narrow-minded. You can't tell people who you really believe Jesus is from the scriptures because that's narrow-minded. I'd rather be narrow-minded around the truth than wide-minded around error. It's all about Jesus and what his word says. So here's what we're gonna look at this morning. 
I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Christ. I believe he's God's only son. Why is that important? And I believe he is the Lord. And at the end of the sermon, we're gonna have to make this very personal. If you believe in Jesus, is he your Christ? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Let's start this message this morning by looking at, I put the ictus on your handout. I should have gave, given you the, the better picture of the ictus that's gonna be on the screen. That's the first one that I put in your handout because the one that I wanted to give you would not print out clearly enough for you to see. Put the next one up for me, Andy. This is the one I really wanted to print out for you because it does a better job of showing some things that I didn't learn until a couple weeks ago. I knew ictus meant fish. I knew it was traditionally taught that when a Christian during the times of persecution would come up to, an, up to another Christian, they would, this is legend now, they would test to see if somebody was a believer in Jesus, if they could talk about Jesus by making the sign with their foot of the top part of the fish. And if the other person was a believer, they would finish it with the bottom part. That's a legend, okay? We do know ichthus means fish, but it's amazing where the first letter of the Greek alphabet that's used to spell ichthus in English transliterated what it means. The letter I, which is iota from the Greek, is the first letter of Jesus' name in the Greek. So the I in ichthus means Jesus. The X, which is the chi in the Greek language, is where we get the first letter in Christos or Christ. So I is Jesus, C-H is Christ, or T-H, if you will. One day I'm going to learn how to wear my glasses and the microphone all at the same time. All right. The T-H, I-C-H, T-H, the T-H is theta from the Greek language into English, and it's theos, is the, so it's the first letter in the word God. Jesus, Christ, God. Then the U, upsilon in the Greek, is the first letter in the word son. And then the sigma, S, in the, transliterated into English, is the first letter in the word savior. So the fish symbol, ichthus, literally translates why it was written that way, Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. And that's what the Apostles' Creed says. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Because Christ means, Jesus means Savior, and Christ means anointed one that we're going to look at this morning. So a very simple message, but to me it's a profound message from God's word. We need to understand the basics of who Jesus is and what he's done for us on the cross at Calvary. Because our salvation is not based on what we do. Our salvation is based on what Christ has done for us on the cross at Calvary. It's all about his amazing grace. It's not about anything we can work up on our own. Because there's no one righteous, scripture says. No, not one. We are only saved because we have an amazing God who loves us and sent his son to die for us number one this morning he's the savior I'm going to focus on what that word Jesus means he's the savior and Jesus Christ is only son our Lord you know scholars biblical scholars tell us that Jesus was not a very uncommon name when Jesus walked the earth as the God man in fact, there were 10 people that we can find in history that lived in Judea that were named Jesus. There were five Jewish high priests at that time named Jesus. From the Old Testament, Jesus comes from the Old Testament word in English, which is Joshua, Yeshua, which means Savior. I should have done a little more history on that word before I named my second son Joshua. I think that's a little too much to expect of a kid the name of Jesus but um I wasn't thinking Christy when we came up with that biblical name Noah we came up with and then we want to know the biblical name so we love Joshua in the Bible and how he stood for the Lord and when he gets older I'm gonna tell him I'm sorry I put too much pressure on you son that you'll never be able to live up to your name but if he knows Christ then Christ will save him and Christ will change him to be all that God would have him to be I pray for that every day for Noah and Joshua but Yeshua comes from Joshua into Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew 121, on your handout and on the screen. 
Mary, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus because Jesus means he will save his people from their sins. So when we say we believe in Jesus, we'll talk about Christ here in a moment. When we believe in Jesus, what we're saying is we believe that Jesus is the Savior and by his death on the cross, it's the only way for salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I had the, oh, I love being in India. What a great trip to go to India. And David's going to share with us again about it on Wednesday night. But to stand in front of so many children that are Hindus and look at them and with all the confidence in the world, because I know what scripture says, that Jesus is the only way to look at Hindu children and say, unless you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. And to tell them, I know that Jesus is the only way because Jesus is the only one who died in my place. He's the only one that died in your place. He is the only savior in this world. We need to believe that today. We not only need to believe it, we need to be convicted enough about it to share that with the lost and dying world instead of saying, well, as long as you've got some religion, it's okay. As long as you have some form of God you worship, it's okay. If they don't know Jesus, they're gonna go to a real hell forever. He's the only savior. You know how many people claim to be Christians and say, well, I believe that, but they really don't believe that because they'll say it's okay for somebody to worship Allah. It's okay for somebody to worship Buddha. It's okay for somebody to worship some other God. That's their choice, but you know, I choose to worship Jesus. He is the only savior. Why? Because he's the only God. There's only one true God. He is Jesus. He is our savior. And it's important that we believe that. It's crucial that we believe that. Number two, he's the Christ. Now let's dispense with one idea real quickly in the message. Christ is not Jesus' last name. He didn't grow up in the Christ family, okay? Even though people use that for a cuss word, a derogatory term, when they say that when they get mad in the grocery store line or about something, they'll say Jesus and the word after it, take God's name in vain. Christ is not his last name. Christ is a title. Just like President Obama, president is not Obama's name, it's his title. If somebody's in the military and they're a lieutenant or a captain, that's not their name, that's their title. Christ is the title that means Messiah or anointed one. When a prophet or a priest or a king would begin their service as a prophet, priest, or king, they would have to go through an anointing service. When Jesus Christ was sent to us, he was anointed by the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was anointed because he's our prophet, priest, and king. He came on a mission to save us from our sins. He's the anointed one. Jesus, Savior, Christ, Messiah, or anointed one. You know, it's amazing. Growing up in church, going to seminary, and it, towards my latter years of seminary, did the Holy Spirit, because of my lack of studying his word, start helping me to understand that the Bible is all about Jesus. I would grow up as a young child, and I'd say, that story about Noah's Ark, that's a great story. But it didn't have anything to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with Jesus. It's a real event in history where God saved people through one person that was obedient to him, but later Jesus would come and be the greatest savior of us all. And now I study the Bible and I look at it totally different because the Bible was written to teach us one main truth, that God would send Jesus Christ to save people from their sins. Think about this. The Old Testament, when you talk about Jesus, Christ, Messiah, anointed one. The Old Testament is all about the anticipation of him coming. The Gospels is all about the incarnation of when he came. The Acts, the, the Acts is the proclamation of Jesus. The Epistles is the explanation of Jesus. And, the, and Revelation is the consummation of Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus. In other words... The Old Testament says he's coming. The gospel says he's here. The book of Acts says he has come. The epistles say he's the Lord. And Revelation say he's coming again. 
It's what we sang about this morning. Jesus, Savior, Christ, the only anointed one to come and be on a mission because he wanted to show us grace and mercy. He wanted to give us something we do not deserve because we all deserve hell. We're all sinners, and since God's holy, since God's just, he must punish sin, but he loves us so much, he punished his son, Jesus Christ, in your place and in mine. What a savior. What a king we worship. Number three, he's God's only son. I started to put King James, only begotten son. We'll talk about that. He's God's only son. No guess of what verse I'm going to use for that. John 3, 16. For God, we miss some of these little words, so loved. He didn't love us. He so loves us. So loved the world that he gave his only son, only son, King James, only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. King James is begotten, begotten, only begotten is really from the Greek, literal from the Greek to English, only begotten from the Greek word monogenes. Mona, it's a compound word. Mona means one, like a monologue. It's one person speaking. Genesis is where we get the word gene from. So in the Greek, when it says he's the only son or only begotten son, it means he's the only gene or genetic, which is pretty cool, which means this, he's one of a kind. There's none like Jesus. He is one and his genetics, no one can touch. No one comes close to. He is absolutely one of a kind, unique in nature. He is part of, he's God himself, but he has different attributes to serve as the son who would come and die on the cross. John 10, 30. I, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. There's only one person that can say that. <laughs> There's only one person that has the genetic character that can say, when you look at me, you're looking at God. That's Jesus. Why? Because Jesus didn't come just to die on the cross to save us from our sins. He came to live a life, an example for us to follow, but he also came so we would know who God is. He came to reveal God because we can't see God in the flesh, but when we see Jesus, we see God. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So what he's essentially saying is, I'm the divine God, the Son. He's talking about the Trinity here. The Nicene Creed puts it very succinctly when it calls Jesus Christ very God of very God. He is very God of very God. Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Do you believe he's the only savior? Do you believe he's the only anointed one? And do you believe that Jesus is God? He's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a good man. Listen carefully to C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity, an incredible statement. Listen to it carefully. C.S. Lewis says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. And he's going to quote the foolish thing that people say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis says this. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. C.S. Lewis says you must make your choice. Either this man Jesus was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can't shut him up for a fool. You can shut him up, excuse me, for being a fool. You can spit at him or kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, and therefore we worship him. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. C.S. Lewis says, he's God. 
in the flesh, came to this earth, and suffered for you and for me. Here's the last one and a very important one that we get. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the Christ. I believe he's God's only son. He's one of a kind. And last and very, very important, I believe he's Lord. Curios in the Greek. Boss, master, owner of everything. That means he's sovereign. That means he's absolute ruler. You know how many people want a savior, but they don't want a Lord? You know, it's interesting when you do a study of the New Testament, the word savior is used a few times, but the word Lord is used over 500 times. Everybody talks about being saved from hell to heaven, but how many people talk about that God is their Lord and they submit to his lordship, not just for salvation, but every single day of their life. That's why Jesus says, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 7, 21, because there's so many people that want a savior, but they don't want a Lord. They want to be their own Lord, their own boss, their own master. Oh, they don't want to go to hell, so just tell me, do I need to say the sinner's prayer that's nowhere found in the Bible? Do I need to walk an aisle and go through some ritual or some motion? Do I need to raise my hand if somebody asks me if I'll say a prayer so I can go to heaven? They want a Savior, but they never surrender to His Lordship. I'm telling you, we live in a world today full of people who have been taught a false gospel that because they walked an aisle, said a prayer, got baptized, go to church, they're going to go to heaven one day. The Bible doesn't say that. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible nowhere mentions a sinner's prayer. The Bible nowhere mentions ask Jesus into your heart. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. Confess, the word confess from the Greek is not talking about just literally saying it. Confession from the Greek into English means it's something you do with your heart that comes out of your heart through your mouth. So you believe with everything in you that he is Lord. And so it comes out of your mouth every single day. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe, not just head knowledge, you trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, to understand this passage, you've got to understand the culture and the context in which it was written. See, in New Testament times, when Paul was writing this under the power of the Holy Spirit, if you went into the public arena and you said that Jesus is God, they would not persecute you. Why? Because Rome at this time had all these different religions and they understood that it was okay if people believed different things because they were at peace. But the Romans had two things that any religious person, no matter what their religion was, must do. They must pay taxes and they must say, Caesar is Lord. That's what they must do. So if you were a follower of Christ and you said, look, I believe Jesus is God, they wouldn't persecute you. But if you said Jesus is Lord, they would kill you, they would burn you at the stake, they would crucify you. You could say anything else, but you better not say Jesus is Lord because you were told you must say Caesar is Lord. So when you hear this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and saved, it is saying you believe so much that he's your master, boss, owner of everything. It's so indwelled in your being that he is Lord that you will say it whether you get killed for it or not. You won't bow down to any other God. You won't submit to any other God that if they're going to run a spear through you, if you say, Jesus, Lord, you're going to say it because he is your Lord. No one wants to die and go to hell. Everyone wants a savior. But how many people today surrender and submit to the Lordship of Christ? He's my boss. He's my master. He's my owner. And I won't submit to anything this world says differently 
I don't care if I have to die for my faith in Jesus, but I will say, because I mean it with everything in my being, he is Lord. Or you can come to church and sing, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the grave and he is Lord, but what happens on Monday? What happens on Tuesday? What happens on Friday night? I mean, he's Lord whether we surrender to him or not is Lord. And one day, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Whether by force or by choice. One day, everyone will. He's the Savior. Is he your Savior? He's the Messiah. He's the Anointed One. Is he your Messiah? He's God's only Son. And he is our Lord. One true Lord. Is he your Lord? I want to close with Philippians 2, a verse that God showed me something that I'd never seen before. It's always been there. I just didn't see it. Philippians 2, 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. That means don't answer it out loud. Not trying to embarrass anybody by saying it wrong, okay? What is the name that's above every name? Now, if you asked me that two weeks ago, I'd say Jesus. But that's wrong. Because it says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What's the name that's above every name? Lord. To the glory of of God the Father. Remember, when this was written, you can't say Jesus is Lord. You must say Caesar is Lord. And Paul says, God has highly exalted Jesus and he's given him the name that is above every other name. Why? Because Jesus really is Lord of all. Boss of all, sovereign king and ruler of all. He is master. And one day every tongue will confess it. Every knee will bow. Everyone will say, according to Philippians 2, 9 through 11, that Jesus Christ is Lord. I know you're in church this morning. But who is Jesus to you? I know the world sends a lot of mixed messages about who Jesus is, but the Bible makes it very clear that he is the Savior, he is the Anointed One, he is God's only one-of-a-kind Son. He's equal to God, and he is Lord. But how many people in this world is he Lord of their life? How many people in this sanctuary is he Lord of your life. It's really easy to say in Sunday morning worship. It's really easy for your pastor to come up here and say, oh, Jesus is my Lord. But how do I live my life? Is the way I live my life a reflection that he truly is Lord of my life? If I wake up every day and seek what Ricky wants, then I'm my own Lord. If I wake up every morning and surrender to him and commit to him every single day and say, God, you're my master, you're my boss, you're my owner, and I'm so glad you are because you know everything about me and you love me anyway. You know everything about this world you created. You know everything, and I want to know what you want me to do because I don't know anything. So leave me today. I surrender to you. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who they've called Jesus Lord with their mouth, but with their spirit, they've never surrendered to his Lordship. Then today is the day of salvation for you. Our Savior wants to save you, but he, don't, he doesn't just want to save you. He wants to be your Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.